talk uh, for everyone that came out. I'm Scott Bernstein. I am a author, historian, true crime journalist, documentarian, all of the above. Uh, I am from Detroit. I grew up on the west side uh, in West Bloomfield, went to high school in Birmingham and went to law school. And instead of practicing law, I decided to write about the law and chronicle the history of organized crime, which is kind of a passion of mine. Um, because I'm from Detroit, the underworld and the history of the underworld in the Motor City is kind of my bread and butter. Uh, I've been involved in a number of television and film projects like Don mentioned, and I've written uh, three books on the history of the Detroit underworld. So uh, my speech I'm about to give or the talk I'm about to give is based on my research and my authoring, uh, telling the history of the Detroit mafia. And I call this uh, speech the silent syndicate because the Detroit mob, unlike the mobs that you probably all have heard about, Al Capone in Chicago, John Gotti in New York, uh, Whitey Bulger in Boston, you know, the real high profile, high wattage uh, guys that are making headlines and, in, in, you know, on your television newscasts, um, those are, you know, loud gangsters. Those are gangsters that are kind of, um, you know, trending towards dying in prison, dying on the street, dying penniless and, and uh, you know, not at the top of their game. And in Detroit, it's the exact opposite. We are the definition of stealth in, in the mafia. And that's why you probably haven't heard much about them in the news because they operate um, in the shadows. They thrive in the shadows and they are able to, to uh, intermingle with legitimate business and make it so you don't really know they exist. But now I'm here to tell you the history of these, these ghost-like characters. So um, the Detroit mob traces its roots to the early 20th century, um, to around 1907, 1908, where there were a, uh, well, let me first start by saying that in, in terms of the Italian mafia in Detroit, 90 95, 99 percent of them trace their roots to a specific town in Sicily known as Terracini. Uh, it's in the, the Palermo province. Um, and like I said, pretty much every major mob figure that uh, has risen through the ranks uh, in Detroit traces their, their lineage to, to Terracini, Sicily. So, you know, there's no coincidence that the first vestiges of the Detroit Italian Mafia came from Terracini. Uh, so you had the Adamo brothers that opened up shop uh, around where Eastern Market is right now, and then in Wyandotte uh, and, and, and uh, in other parts of the Downriver area. Uh, and around 1906, 1907, there were three Adamo brothers and their top enforcers, uh, guys that uh, were helping them run their prostitution, gambling, extortion uh, rackets were the Gianola brothers, which were uh, uh, distant cousins of the Adamos that also came from Terracini. And the first picture I'm going to show is a picture of Salvatore Sam Gianola. And in 1913, uh, the Gianolas unseated the Adamos and killed all the Adamo brothers and, and took over for themselves. So Sam Gianola and uh, his brothers, uh, Vito and Antonio took over from the three Adamo brothers in 1913. And they would lead the family uh, into the prohibition era. And here in Michigan, uh, we went dry. Uh, we uh, enacted the uh, prohibition statute in the state of Michigan before anyone else uh, in the country. We were the first state to go dry in 1918. Uh, the rest of the country went dry in 1920. So we had a two year start on that, which was a real feather in the cap of the gangsters that were operating in Detroit. It meant that they had a two year start on everyone around the country on building infrastructure for their illegal liquor businesses, which really at the end of the day, the Volstead Act which was the federal act uh, prohibition was to, you know, cleanse 
the the American communities of of uh, you know wrongdoing or or you know it was trying to make people live on the straight and narrow uh, and kind of maybe vanquish uh, uh, criminal mentality when in reality all it did was boost criminal mentality and ingenuity and it really was the seeds that eventually bloomed into the modern American uh, gangland environment and, and, and landscape. Uh, all of the mafias around the country were all birthed from prohibition. Um, guys that had come over from uh, different parts of Europe, whether they be Jewish, Italian, uh, Irish, Polish, everyone got rich off of bootlegging. Um, and in Detroit, because we went dry so early and we did get a head start and our geographic proximity to Canada uh, made us really the epicenter of the bootlegging industry in Detroit. Uh, so the Gianolas were at the head of, of what would become the Detroit Mafia crime family. Didn't really have a name at the time. They were just kind of uh, the Gianola gang. And right around when the nation was going to prohib uh, going into our prohibition period in 1920, the Gianolas uh, and a underling of theirs by the name of Bloody John Vitali, Giovanni Vitali, who they called Bloody John, uh, they erupted into a street war for control of the city. And the Gianolas uh, brothers were both killed uh, around the Eastern Market area. One of them was killed uh, walking into a bank Another one of them was killed uh, going to a funeral. And Bloody John Vitali um, eventually turned on the Gianolas over the murder of his best friend, a guy by the name of Sam Bosco, who had been a childhood uh, confidant of Bloody John Vitali. Bosco had gotten into a feud with the Gianola brothers. And the Gianolas, despite Bloody John Vitali saying, you can't touch him because he's uh, my best friend. They said, we don't care, even though you're one of our right-hand men. And they killed Sam Bosco, which uh, unleashed the, uh, this, this plan of vengeance that was uh, put forth by Bloody John Vitali. And one of the most audacious uh, attempted mob hits, or I guess it was a mob hit um, in, in Detroit history, took place in 1920 at the peak of this war um, in between the two Gianola brothers being killed. Uh, Bloody John Vitali was uh, arrested and put into uh, the Wayne County Jail, which uh, it, it, it was where the old DPD headquarters was uh, on Bobian, right by um, Greektown. I'm not sure if that's where they house the Wayne County prisoners anymore because they moved the DPD headquarters. Um, but dating back all the way to the 20s, uh, Wayne County lockup was right there, right, uh, right where Greektown is, right above uh, DPD headquarters. And Bloody John Vitale and his son, Joe Vitale, were arrested and put into a lockup at Wayne County. Sam Giannola at that time had not been killed and he got tipped off. And he sent gunmen into the jail to, sp to spray with automatic gunfire the lockup cell where Bloody John Vitale and his son were. Um, his son ended up being killed. Uh, Bloody John Vitale ended up surviving it um, and then ended up killing Sam Giannola weeks later. And then about a couple months after Sam Giannola was murdered, Bloody John Vitale was murdered. So you had all this violence taking place in the 19 teens early 20s, and then it, it didn't stop, but it changed. Uh, at the, when the Gianolas were all gone and the uh, bloody John Vitale was gone, a man by the name of Salvatore Catalanati uh, rose to power. And he was only about 25 years old. They called him Singing Sam because he was a amateur opera singer. And he was a diplomat. Uh, he called a meeting of all of the um, members that were involved in this war that had lasted from 1918 to 1920, and he called them all to a meeting at his mansion, and his mansion at the time was what is now the mayor's mansion, the Manugian mansion before it was 
bought by the Manugian family, I believe in the 30s or 40s, back in 1920, uh, uh, Catalanati owned it. And it was right on the Detroit River. And he would hold these dinner parties uh, that were famous in, 19, in between, let's say, 1920 and 1927, 28, uh, where, you know, luminaries from all around the city would come to his mansion, uh, not just criminals, judges, lawyers, doctors, uh, <laughs> actors of the day. And they would be these black tie affairs where he would serve these lavish meals. And at the end, he would set up like an opera theater and sing opera for them. Uh, so he was, he was a very unique individual and he was very uh, beloved by the street because he was nonviolent and he was diplomatic. And he installed a geographic allocation um, for the prohibition era that, that lasted from 1920 to 1933 when, when prohibition was um, repealed. And the, the allocation system, which was, a great, which was agreed upon by uh, all of the members of, of the Detroit underworld, um, gave certain parts of the city to certain criminal factions. And those geographic um, delineations, if you will, were able to hold. Now, that didn't mean there wasn't violence. Uh, there was violence, but the violence wasn't gang versus gang like you had in other cities. In New York, you had, uh, you know, the Irish taking on or sorry, in, in New York, you had the, the African-Americans taking on the uh, Italians. In Chicago, you had the Irish taking on the Italians. In Philadelphia and Boston, you had the Jews taking on the Italians. But in Detroit, uh, the violence was all internal. Each gang had violence within its own ranks but there there wasn't one gang uh fighting another gang um hold on one second i want to so this man right here eventually becomes the face of the detroit mafia the godfather for 40 years if you uh, ever saw the movie, The Godfather, Don Corleone, a lot of similarities to this man. This was a picture of him at a very young age. I'll give you a picture of him at a later age as we move on here. That is uh, Giuseppe Zarilli, a.k.a. Joe Uno. Uh, and Joe Zarilli would eventually uh, create the modern-day Detroit Mafia with his brother-in-law. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to really quickly give you a breakdown of what was going on during the 1920s in Detroit, you had several bootlegging gangs that, again, were all working in concert and uh, not killing each other, but sometimes turning against one another within their own gang. I'm sorry if I'm not articulating that incredibly well. Uh, so you had the East Side Gang, uh, which was based on the East Side, uh, which was ran by uh, Joe Zarilli and his brother-in-law, and uh, first cousin and best friend. That's a picture of the two of them together from 1931. Uh, Joe's Joe really about 12 years after you saw him in that one picture. He's on the left and uh, Black Bill Toko, which was his uh, brother-in-law, first cousin and best friend is on the right. So they were the East Side Gang. Um, out of Hamtramck, you had a group that was known as the West Side Gang, which was also an Italian group that was led by uh, Chester Big Chet Lamare. Um, you had the River Gang, which was also an Italian group that was led by Pete Licavoli, Horsehead Pete. And the Licavoli Gang was a group of St. Louis transplants that had come to Detroit and started their own bootlegging group. Uh, they were called the River Gang, and, and Horsehead Pete Licavoli and his brothers, uh, as well as his right-hand man, a guy by the name of Joe Misery Mosheri. You probably have all heard these last names, and you will probably, as I keep on talking, you'll recognize some more last names. Um, you had the River Gang, you had the East Side Gang, you had the West Side Gang, you had the Lizard Gang, which was the Polish mafia out of uh, parts of Hamtramck. You had... Uh, a Irish gang that was out of Corktown, which is 
by the old Tiger Stadium, uh, which was led by a guy by the name of uh, Legs Lehman, jo- uh, Joseph Legs Lehman. And then you had the Purple Gang. Uh, and I will, uh, I'll do a quick deep dive into the Purple Gang. I don't want to get too off uh, subject, but Don, wherever Don is, we should definitely do a purple, we should do an all Purple Gang talk at some point in the future. Uh, the Purple Gang was the Jewish Mafia. Uh, I actually traced my family roots uh, to the leaders and founders of the Purple Gang. Uh, I had some technical difficulties this morning with my thumb drive, so I don't actually have pictures of the Bernstein brothers to show you. Um, but the Purple Gang was started by the four Bernstein brothers, Abe, Joe, Ray, and Izzy. Uh, uh, come, they had come as young boys from Russia, uh, landed in Brooklyn, eventually made their way to the east side of Detroit when they were about 9, 10 years old. Um, and the Purple Gang really started as a schoolyard sandbox group of bullies when they were literally 12, 13, 14 years old. They all went to this school uh, on Hastings Street um, that was called uh, the Bishop School. And it was a, uh, for lack of a better term, it was a reformatory. I mean, it was for kids that weren't doing well in the public school system. Uh, so they would have put them all in, in uh you know, a school for bad kids. And the Bernstein brothers and uh, two other sets of brothers, the Fleischer brothers and the Keywell brothers, um, eventually came together uh, to create the Purple Gang. They were first uh, um, apprentices, if you will, for a group of older Jewish racketeers in the late 19 teens, early 20s, that was known as the Oakland Sugar House Gang off of Oakland Avenue. Um, and they mentored the Bernsteins and the Fleischers and the Keywells. And around 1925, uh, they staked out on their own. And in a very short period of time, became really the, the bootlegging brand of Detroit was the Purple Gang, even though the Italians are the ones that you hear more about you know, in movies and in television. During Prohibition in Detroit, uh, it really all started and ended with the Purples. And because of that, the Italians, the Irish, uh, the Polish had to do business with them. And it created these inroads and these links and these ties and these connections um, between the, at least between the Italians and the Jews in the Detroit underworld that would last, you know, through the 20th century into the 1980s and 90s. Um, even though the Purple Gang itself um, disbanded in the 1930s, most of the remnants of the Purple Gang uh, just came underneath the banner of what became the Toko's early crime family. And they worked hand in hand uh, for almost 100 years. And it all started in the 1920s. The East Side Gang, the River Gang, they were all very close with the Bernstein Brothers. And uh, the Bernstein Brothers headquartered out of the Book Cadillac Hotel, um, the one that's still standing uh, downtown right now. Uh, It opened in, I believe, 1923. And A. Bernstein moved into the penthouse of the Book Cadillac in 1925. And he lived there until he died in 1969. Uh, And he would act as a advisor or, or kind of de facto consigliere to the Italians. Um, so this brings us to 1930 and the creation of what is the Toko Zerilli crime family. So Sam Calinati dies at 35 after a bout with pneumonia. Um, obviously, you know, the medical profession wasn't as advanced back then as it is now. And after 10 years, and again, I, it's misleading to say it was 10 years of peace because there was a lot of violence on the street. It just was a 180 from what you were seeing in all the other major cities where you had gangs fighting other, uh, fighting one street faction, fighting another street faction. Like for instance, with the purple gang, I do a lot of purple gang talks to, to, uh, to, to Jewish groups. And on the West side of Detroit, on the West side of Metro Detroit in the Jewish community, there's this kind of, romanticized fallacy that the purple gang were these Robin Hoods and these protectors of the community and that they were protecting the Jews from being extorted and protecting the Jews from being bullied. Um, When in reality, if you study organized crime and, and to the level that I have, you realize that all organized crime groups, they prey on their own. 
It's not the Italians coming into the Jewish neighborhoods to extort the Jews. It's the Jews going into the Jewish neighborhoods to extort the Jews. So I tried to explain to people that the Purple Gang, and these are my relatives, these were not good people. These were ruthless murderers, uh, extortionists, racketeers that preyed on their community um, and preyed on each other. So the Purple Gang is credited with over 500 murders in eight years. And there's some people that place that number at between 800 and 1,000. And 99% of those murders were Jews. So that, that's something to, to, to make note of. So uh, Tam, Sam Calinati dies in 1930, and another street war erupts. And this street war, uh, because the media was more advanced than it was in, in the 19-teens, uh, this war uh, that lasts between 1930 and 1931 garners a ton of headlines in, in, in the city of Detroit. It's known as the Crosstown mob war and it was fought between um the east side and the west side uh pete licavoli even though i have a picture of him up there right now really had nothing uh to do with that war although he sided with the um he sided with toko and zarilli and this picture was actually taken um on february 10th 1931 at the very end of the war uh and I'll tell you what they were arrested for. So east side was Toko and Zarilli. The west side was led by uh, Cesare Big Chet Lamare. And Big Chet was someone that was the opposite of Toko and Zarilli, who I said were stealth and, and kind of thrived in the shadows. Big Chet Lamare was, was like Al Capone uh, and fancied himself Detroit's own Al Capone. Uh, he ran the, the, what is Hamtramck now? Uh, he, he headquartered out of a, a place called the Venice Cafe, which was a 24 hour uh, kind of vice emporium where you could go and you could, you could get espresso and cannoli, but you could also get prostitutes and drugs and gambling. Uh, and, and Chet Lamare um, married a, a young woman uh, who was Sicilian and uh, they went on their honeymoon to Sicily. And they came back and Chet Lamare decided that he didn't like what Sam Calinati had put in place for those 10 years. He didn't want geographic allocation. He wanted the whole city for himself. So he declared war on his former allies, uh, Joe Zerilli and Black Bill Toko of the East Side Gang. That war erupted, lasted for about a year. Um, and it ended with two major uh, events, all taking place in early 1931. So first, uh, Big Chet Lamare decides the best way to kill Toko and Zerilli is to pretend like he wants to make peace with them. And he uses his right hand and his second in charge, um, a guy by the name of Angelo, the chairman, Maley, and this was Chet Lamare's protege. Uh, Angelo Maley was the person that was tapped by Chester Lamare to go and, and make a arrangement with Toko and Zerilli to show up for a peace conference. But Angelo Maley is, is, a, is very savvy. And he realizes that his boss's plan is not going to work. And that if he goes along with his boss's plan, both him and his boss are both him and his boss are probably going to end up dead. So Angela Maley makes a decision that really reverberates for the next 100 years, uh, or not 100 years, but the next 70 years, where he decides to change sides in the middle of the war and tip off Toko and Zerilli to what is about to happen to them and decides to leave the West Side Gang and join the East Side Gang with the promise that he will be part of the leadership group that takes over the city. So Chester, uh, Chester Lamare thinks that Angela Maley is uh, helping him set up this ambush, when in reality, he's helping thwart the ambush. So what eventually happened was called the Werner Highway Fish Market Murders. And Toko and Zerilli um, decided to send two sacrificial lambs in their place. Uh, they sent a, um, a guy by the name of... Um, Gaspar Malazzo, 
who was a New York uh, mob figure that had come to Detroit during the war uh, to try to help mediate the war, um, had, been, had been staying in Detroit for a couple of years, and his bodyguard um, named Sam Perino. So Sam Perino and Chess, uh, sorry, Sam Perino and Gaspar Malazzo show up at the Werner Highway Fish Market, which interestingly enough, me and my fiance were, were, were doing a little bit of a, uh, you know, historical roaming in Detroit. And I wanted to see the, the actual place where the Werner Highway Fish Market murder took place. And today, 90 years later, it's still a fish market. It's not called the Werner Highway Fish Market, uh, but it's still a, a, a fish place. Um, it's not in the nicest of areas. It's right outside of Eastern Market. You could walk, uh, if, you, if, you, if you're in Eastern Market uh, at the, at the um, I would say the northernmost end of Eastern Market, uh, if you just walk across Gratiot and walk up a couple blocks, no? No, I, would, I wouldn't do that. I'm just saying in, in theory, uh, it's still a fish market. So uh, it's not that, it's literally across the street from where Eastern Market was. Uh, and instead of a peace conference, Malazzo and Perino are murdered. Um, but that does not take off the head of the snake. And in fact, this tells Chester Lamari that he's in trouble. And in a scenario that comes out of Hollywood, I mean, just, you, you couldn't make this kind of stuff up. Toko Zerilli and Maley go to Chester Lamare's brand new wife and say, you need to help us kill your husband. And she agrees. And she, in exchange, and she makes, she's, she's pretty savvy in her own right. She makes a deal. She's like, I'll help you kill my husband, but you have to give me 80% of, of my husband's wealth, uh, which she then took with her back to Sicily. Uh, so Chester Lamari lived in a big mansion and they didn't just convince his wife. They also convinced his bodyguards to, to flip on him. And Chester Lamari would have uh, an espresso after dinner and was in his living room sipping his espresso uh, when, his, when, her, when his wife excused herself and let in the killers, uh, two of Toko and Zerilli's top guys. They came, they came in, they killed uh, Chester Lamare, and the Crosstown Mob War was done, and the modern-day Detroit Mafia was born, uh, known as the Toko Zerilli crime family. And Black Bill Toko and Joe Zerilli would go on to lead the crime family uh, pretty much unscathed. Joe, uh, Joe Zerilli never did a day in prison, uh, died peacefully in 1977, um, Black Bill Toko had to do two years for tax evasion in the 1930s, but came out of prison in 1940 and then didn't do another day in jail until he passed away in uh, 1972 of a heart attack. But uh, I want to color up what happened from 1930 till, let's say, around today, and uh, I will do that right now. So the, what became the Detroit Mafia, the Toko's really crime family, um, became known locally as the partnership or the combination. And the reason it was called that was because all of the bootlegging gangs outside of Chester Lamari's West Side Gang, or I guess I'd say the remnants of the West Side Gang, and all the other bootlegging gangs all came underneath one banner. And that banner was the Tokos Relay Crime Family. So it was no longer this part of the city was Irish, this part of the city was Jewish, this part of the city was Italian. The Italians had taken over the entire city and the Jews and the Italian, or sorry, the Jews and the Irish and the Polish all agreed to come underneath that one umbrella of an organization. And because Detroit had always been uh, this epicenter of bootlegging and, they, and, and people knowing how to smuggle contraband, it's not a coincidence that in this business structure uh, paradigm shift away from where everybody's bread and butter in, in gangland landscapes around the country during prohibition, everyone's bread and butter was, was illegal alcohol. But every crime family in America had to change 
game plans when prohibition went by the wayside. So in Detroit, there were a number of, I would say, safeguards put in to ensure a crime family that would ascend to heights that really no other crime family in America would ever ascend to. And Joe Zarelli and Black Bill Toko had certain requirements for people to enter the ranks of the crime family. And those requirements that they put in in the 1930s would make it so you had an organization that when every other crime family in America was falling apart from, let's say, starting in the 1950s into the 1980s, Detroit was just going about their business, making a lot of money, making a lot of inroads in politics, in the law enforcement, in, you know, in the judicial system, um, and were really able to um, build stronger as all these other crime families were weakening. And that was because of the brilliance in, in Toko and Zerilli and what they, what they wanted from their crime family. And this is what they wanted. They wanted education, they wanted diversification, and they wanted intermarriage. And those three principles made this family, again, they're a unicorn. Uh, they are truly one of a kind in the sense that uh, stability, functionality, and for the most part, nonviolence. I mean, obviously, if you're a mob family, you're going to be involved in violence. But if you compare the amount of violence that the Detroit mob has had to employ to other cities, it, 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 it's, there's no comparison. You know, in Detroit, just for example, let's just say in the 1970s, um, I'm just going to use the 70s as an example. Let's just say, for instance, there were 15 mob murders in Detroit in a 10 year period. In Chicago, there were 100. In New York, there were 200. So yes, there was going to be violence, but it's, it was always going to be at a, at a lesser um, rate because Joe Zerilli and Black Bill Toko were uh, people that would um, really espouse the notion of violence is only a last resort measure. So when they were building this, this new version of their bootlegging crime family, and they were uh, expanding into sports gambling, extortion, prostitution, labor corruption, sanitation, uh, construction. Um, they were doing so with a, a very detailed plan. So the first thing they said was that anybody that's coming into our crime family needs to have assets outside of gambling, loan sharking, and extortion. Like you need to be able to show reportable income on your tax return. Um, you need to have legitimate business interests because the easiest way to get picked off by the government if you're a mobster is to be driving a $100,000 car and living in a million dollar house and wearing uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars on your pinkies and your neck but you're claiming that you make $20,000 a year. Uh, so Tokens really made sure that anybody that was coming into the crime family would have a diversified business portfolio. They also demanded that the second generation, the guys that were the sons of the original founders, the, the, the second generation Maley's, the second generation Tokos, the second generation Zerilli's, they all had to have a college business degree, which again, another instance of how Detroit is a unicorn. If you, if, you, if you went around the country and you tried to count in each crime family, how many guys, forget about business degrees, just went to college at all, took any type of college classes, you'd be hard pressed to find one or two over a hundred year period in each crime family. In Detroit, the entire second and third generation of the Detroit crime family all have business degrees from very, very respectable universities, uh, Notre Dame, Syracuse, University of Michigan, University of Detroit, uh, Black Bill Toko and Joe's early sons, both graduated with business degrees from the University of Detroit. Um, Angelo Maley's son uh, went to Notre Dame and actually was a war hero. Little Vince Maley, um, some of you might know who he is. He died about 10 years ago. Um, 
and was a second generation uh, mob leader. Fascinating, fascinating character figure that really could have been a superstar in, in whatever endeavors he would have gone into. He just happened to choose the mob. And, but he was a very good businessman in addition to his, uh, um, his mob activity. He controlled uh, the steel industry here in Detroit. But back when he was a young man, he was a superstar in the military. He went from Notre Dame uh, into what would be now considered the Navy SEALs or, or um, uh, uh, Delta Force. He was Special Forces uh, during World, World, World War II. He was General MacArthur's driver, and he walked away from World War II with three Purple Hearts. And the most interesting, and this is his son. I don't have a picture of him, but I'm talking about Angelo's son. To the day Vince, his name was Vince, to the day that Vince Maley died, he wore a Jewish star around his neck. And everyone would be like, why is an Italian man wearing a Jewish star around his neck? And the story is, and it's been confirmed on an, uh, from a number of sources, as well as documents, uh, uh, State Department documents that I've been able to get my hands on, but he's also confirmed this, and his family has confirmed this, that he was if not the first person, one of the first dozen American soldiers to liberate the concentration camps. And when he was liberating Auschwitz, uh, a Jewish woman that was being saved was so over the, you know, over the moon happy that she was being freed from this concentration camp. She took off her Jewish star and gave it to him. And he kept that, uh, he wore that till the day he died in 2009. Uh, of, of cancer. But just to show you how these people that Toko and the original Tokons are really the, the, the younger generation that they were grooming, were going to be like them on steroids. It, it was going to be like, you know, these, these brilliant criminal businessmen with, with college business degrees and college accounting degrees. Uh, another one of the second generation it was a guy by the name of uh, Big Mike Polizzi. And Big Mike went to Syracuse and got an accounting degree so, so from the 19, late 40s until he died in the late 90s. He was the CFO. I mean, the, the Detroit mob had a chief financial officer and that was his job. He didn't have, he was, a, 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 yeah, let, let me also just really quickly, I, I, I know I'm a little bit all over the place here, but just bear with me. When the crime family was installed in 1931, when, when the, the new version of the Detroit Mafia was born, like they were doing across the country, they were installing a uniform hierarchy where every city would have a family and that family would have a boss, an underboss who was a second in charge, a consigliere, which was an advisor or a third in charge. Underneath uh, those three people, they would have captains, which were kind of like vice presidents, um, at, at big corporations where, you know, you had a captain that was in charge of construction, you had a captain that was in charge of gambling, you had a captain that was in charge of sanitation. Um, and then you had underneath them, you had soldiers. And then underneath them, you had associates, guys that couldn't officially come into the crime family because they weren't Italian. Um, and big Mike Polizzi filled one of these roles where his entire, he was a captain and he didn't have, but most captains, if you're a capo, you have 15 guys, 20 guys that you're in charge of. Mike, please didn't have anyone he was in charge of. They didn't want him to have to bother with being in charge of the rank and file. They said to him, your only job is to do our money, is to make it that our money's clean, that we know where to, you know, to, to hide our money. We know how to wash our money. And, and that was all Mike Polizzi did for 40 years. And he did it again. He did it brilliantly. Um, so we move forward into the 1940s and 50s. And at this point, uh, another um, brilliant uh, move by the Detroit mob, which again reverberated across the nation, was the decision to exploit the Teamsters pension fund to build Las Vegas. Um, and in Detroit has always been uh, ground zero for the Teamsters, Jimmy Hoffa. Um, I 
I got a mug shot of Jimmy Hoffa. So Jimmy Hoffa uh, in the 1930s is a young up and coming uh, labor organizer. He makes his name. Um, thanks, Don. He makes his name um, at Kroger, uh, organizing what was known as the strawberry strike. And it was a strike of um, produce uh, unpackers on the Kroger docks. And they were uh, treated very poorly by management. They had horrible work conditions and bad pay. And Jimmy Hoffa, I think as a 19 year old, organized this huge strike. It was on the front page of all the newspapers. Eventually Kroger fired him for organizing the strike, but the Teamsters came and scooped him up and he was a rising star in the Teamsters. Uh, through one of his girlfriends, he meets the mafia and they make this kind of unholy alliance in the 1930s that eventually starts to bear fruit in the 1950s. So uh, he, through the 30s, is, is kind of on the fast track. In 1947, he becomes the youngest member uh, ever to be appointed to the Teamsters adv uh, Advisory Board. In 1951, he becomes vice president of the Teamsters. In 1957, he becomes president of the Teamsters and opens up the doors to the pension fund. And anybody that was a member of organized crime in America uh, could come to Jimmy Hoffa and the Teamsters and get loans for tens of millions of dollars with incredibly low interest rates, uh, in some cases, no interest rates, to build Las Vegas casinos. Um, and that's how the mob took over Las Vegas in the 1950s or built Las Vegas in the 1950s. And that's how eventually Jimmy Hoffa met his demise. And as the 20th century is, is going on and the tokens are really, uh, the, the patriarchs are getting older, they are grooming two brothers that don't fit the, the typical Detroit mob um, pedigree. They're not, uh, oh, let me back up one more time. So diversification, education, and then intermarriage. I mentioned it, but I didn't expand on it. So if you were going to become a member of the Detroit Mafia, you had to be educated, you had to have a business portfolio, and you also had to be married to another member's daughter or niece or granddaughter. Um, but the Jackaloni brothers were the exception. Um, the Jackaloni brothers, uh, Tony Jackaloni, that's a picture of Tony. And then his younger brother, um, Vito, or who they called uh, Billy. I got a better picture of him, hold on. That's a picture of him from the 90s. Uh, so, hold on. So, Tony Giacalone, um and Billy Giacalone did not come from any mob pedigree. Their dad was a, uh, a produce peddler in Eastern Market. Um, they were just a couple of street toughs running around uh, the city of Detroit that caught the eye of Joe Zerilli, Black Bill Toco, and then their brother-in-law, a guy by the name of uh, Pietro Machine Gun Pete Corrado. And uh, Machine Gun Pete Corrado was the Toco and Zerilli street boss. And that's another, uh, that's another hallmark, if you will, of the Detroit mob and why they've been able to be so successful as opposed to other crime families. Diversification, education, insulation. Uh, put as many buffers between you and the criminal activity you're doing as possible. That's why from the very start, the Zerilli and Toco uh, relationship made sure that they always would have a street boss that was doing their bidding on the street. So they didn't actually have to interact with any of their soldiers or their captains to relay criminal activity. They would relay it to the Jackalones and the Jackalones would then relay it to everybody else. So they trusted implicitly the two Jackalone brothers, Tony and Billy, and really used the Jackalones as lightning rods because as little jail time as Toko, Zerilli, Maley, and Corrado did, they did very little jail time. The guys that were put out front 
to take all the heat, the Jackaloni brothers did quite a bit of jail time. But they were okay with that because they liked playing that role. And they were okay with, they wanted to be the face of the franchise. And, and for people, I'm guessing of all of our ages, um, these are the, when you think of the Detroit mafia, you really don't think of Tokens really because Tokens really were so quiet. You think of the Jackalones. Um, they were the ones that are uh, talked about most on the news. They're the ones who were, were connected to the Jimmy Hoffa murder and, and so forth. Uh, and Tony and Billy Jackalone become the day-to-day pit bulls um, running the, the street affairs for Tokens really starting in around 1950 and lasting all the way into the 2000s. Um, and this was what, this is now what brings us to Jimmy Hoffa and his demise. So Jimmy Hoffa lets them into the pension fund. They build Las Vegas. It's the golden goose that lays the golden eggs and Hoffa has to go to prison. He comes out of prison. And while he was in prison, he had to give up the presidency of the teamsters. What in his mind, he was only giving it up on a temporary basis in order to get out of prison early. They made a deal with Richard Nixon in the White House for a commutation. Uh, He was supposed to do 12 years. He ended up only doing about four, but in order for him to get out of prison, he had to step down from the Teamsters and agree not to run for Teamsters president when he comes out. He claimed that he didn't know that he had agreed not to run for the presidency, that they kind of slipped it in, with a, a slipped language into the commutation without him knowing. That's neither here nor there. So he gets out of prison and the, the mob, specifically the Detroit mob, who Jimmy Hoffa is an asset of, because he's from Detroit, he belongs to the Detroit mafia and the Detroit mafia puppets him. Um, they tell him, we don't want you to come back. We want you to retire. Your replacement, a guy by the name of Frank Fitzsimmons is a lot easier to handle. He doesn't want as many kickbacks as you. He takes orders better than you. You know, you're a, Jimmy Hoffa was not someone that wanted to take orders from people. Um, and he was someone that really, to use the term, had gotten too big for his britches and really believed that he was untouchable and not realizing that the reason he got in power in the first place was because of these incredibly dangerous individuals. And if he tried to cross these dangerous individuals, they were going to make him disappear, which they did. Uh, So Hoffa says he's not going to step down from the Teamsters. He then goes and makes a deal with the FBI. Not a lot of people know this. At the end of Jimmy Hoffa's life, he was a full-fledged FBI informant and had made a deal with the FBI that if they removed his, uh, the block from him taking the presidency over again, he wasn't allowed to run for president, the presidency, I think, until 1985 or 1986. They made it so he could run in 1976. And the, and the mob knew that if he ran in that election, he was going to win that election and he would kick them out of the Teamsters. He would kick them out of Vegas. The Golden Goose would stop making the Golden Eggs. Um, and Tony Jackaloni and Billy Jackaloni were assigned to make him disappear. And they did. And it's probably the, uh, the perfect murder and the, probably the, the most speculated unsolved murder in American history. It, it, the mythology just feeds on itself. And there's, as you know, there are, it seems to be that there are digs or searches every couple of years. Right now, I know they're getting ready to dig down in New Jersey, looking for them again. Uh, there's also rumors that they might be digging in Windsor soon. So we're sitting here 46 years removed Uh, And Tony Giacalone and Billy Giacalone really got away with the perfect murder. And they really were proud of themselves for that. And they really used or, or, or felt like murdering Jimmy Hoffa and getting rid of the body and having everyone speculate it for all, for all this time to them, that was like their crowning achievement. And they would frequently joke with people um, and I thought, and, and I believe this was part of the reason they were able to get away with it was a giant disinformation campaign launched by the Jackalones where they were telling a hundred people, a hundred different things and just muddling the waters as much as possible, making it as murky and as 
uh, confusing as possible where you're, you have people that would be in the know, should be in the know, but are being told falsehoods in order to tickle the wire, if you will, and get people talking about things that never happened and spreading rumors to the degree, to the point now where even now in, in 2021, you have people all around the country, people that are high ranking mafia figures that claim they know what happened to Jimmy Hoffa. And they know, then they're saying that because they were told by someone that was a high ranking mob figure, what happened to Jimmy Hoffa. But that person that told them was lied to. So that brings us uh, getting closer to the modern day. And then I'm gonna wrap up and open it up to questions. So Toko and Zerilli both passed in the seventies and the family uh, was passed on to the second generation of Toko and Zerilli, specifically uh, Black Bill Toko's son, uh, Giacomo Black Jack Toko. And uh, Black Jack Toko was the godfather of the Detroit Mafia from 1977. Uh, well, actually I say unofficially from around 1973, 74, until he died in 2014. There was a bit of a soap opera that um, surrounded his ascent Joe Zerilli and Black Bill Toko had initially agreed to hand the family over to Joe Zerilli's son, uh, Tony Zerilli. But Tony Zerilli got caught stealing $6 million from a Las Vegas casino. And it was really the first time the mafia was caught with their hand in the cookie jar uh, in Vegas. This was in 1967. Most of the Vegas skim cases that you know about or you've read about or you watched in the movie Casino all came down in 1985. This was 1967. So this was a huge embarrassment for the Detroit mob that one of their sons, one of the mob princes of Detroit kind of spilled the beans, if you will, to the FBI, to everybody that the Italians across the country were really in control of Las Vegas. There'd always been rumors and, and, you know, people that uh, uh, espoused certain theories that had never been proved. But when the federal government arrests you and shows proof that you've stolen $6 million from a Las Vegas casino, it, it, you know, the paper don't lie, tape don't lie. And in this case, it became kind of open season. It, it might have taken another 10 to 15 years to get everyone else out of Vegas in terms of the mob influence. By the late 80s, the mafia in, in Vegas was pretty much done. But in 1967, it was still a, a huge enterprise. And Tony Zerilli getting caught uh, was a big embarrassment. And Joe Zerilli decided to demote his own son and promote his nephew. And uh, that caused quite a bit of consternation that would last until the 2000s. Um, Black Bill Toko and Tony Zerilli, just like their fathers, had been first cousins, best friends. Um, but it had always been arranged where Tony Zerilli would be the boss when their dads died and Black Jack would be the underboss. But uh, that was changed at the last moment. And right before Joe Zerilli died, he told his son, I no longer want you to be the boss of the family. I now want my nephew because you screwed up. Um, so at first, there was some bad blood between Black Jack and Tony Z, but Black Jack offered Tony Z the underboss position and told him he could pretty much have autonomy uh, with his, his soldiers. So from, let's say, 1977, 78 uh, into the 90s, Tony Z really was kind of left to do his own thing. He didn't actually have to report everything he was doing to Jack Toko. And then in 1996, Operation Game Tax was filed. It was the biggest racketeering indictment that was ever filed against the Detroit mob. And it was all based on wiretaps of Tony Zerilli's crew, um, specifically his nephew, Nove Toko, and another nephew of his, Pauli Corrado, uh, were driving around in a car for about three years from around 91 until 94 uh, that was wired for sound. And there's actually an interesting story about how they wired the, the car. If any of you guys have ever been to Luciano's on 17 and Garfield, uh, that was a place that used to have a lot of late night card games and Novi Toko, Luciano's on 17 and Garfield. Sorry, I'm, so I'm talking louder because it seems like the 
the, the food is, is making a little bit of noise. So I'm just talking a little bit louder, but I'm, I'm going to wrap up here in a second and we'll open it up to questions. Uh, it's all right. So um, uh, Luciano's on 17 and Garfield used to have a lot of uh, uh, late night poker games and Nove, to uh, Nove Toco and Pauli Corrado would often stop in there on Wednesday nights and, you know, get to the restaurant at about nine o'clock at night. They wouldn't leave till about five or six in the morning. So it was a, it was a, a, a winter night. It was snowing out and the FBI had had this whole thing timed and they, they got a car, an identical car to the car that they were going to bug. And they go and they park the car that they had in the place that Novi and Polly had parked their car and take the car that Polly and Novi had driven there and they take it back to the FBI headquarters and they bug it. So if anyone came out to look at the car, they would see, they would look at the car. It would look like it was their car, but it was a dummy car. Then an hour or two later, they come, they replace the car with the original car and the original car is, is bugged. And for the next three years, Everything that Nove Toko and Pauli Corrado and Tony Zerilli are saying in that car is heard by the FBI. And this Jack Toko was someone that uh, wasn't my biggest fan and uh, was someone that uh, really didn't want to be identified as a mob Don in Detroit. He wanted to be known as a community leader, as this benevolent uh, father figure to the Italian community in Detroit. And he was that. Um, but he didn't like to be known as a, as a mafia boss. He wanted only the people within his organization to know that. But General Joe and Jane Q. Public in Metro Detroit, he did not want them to think of him as a mafia boss. And in fact, he had no criminal record. So anybody that, that mentioned him as a mob boss uh, was sued. He filed the 12 lawsuits between 1978 and 1993, um, claiming defamation, slander, libel. But uh, the 1996 case with those wiretaps uh, really brought an end to the charade that Jack Toko could tell people that he wasn't a godfather. He was convicted in 1998 and very, very suspiciously, frankly, was sentenced to a year in prison. Um, there, were, there, there was a, a, a protocol and a, uh, a precedent that had been set for years with racketeering cases. And that's the way that the FBI goes after mob families. And as a general rule, if you're the number one defendant in a federal racketeering case, on average, you're gonna get a 20 to 40 year sentence. If you're lucky, you'll get 20 years. And to kind of demonstrate how networked in the Detroit mob was back in the 30s, and is today, uh, Jack Tocco was sentenced to a year in prison. The prosecutors were so incensed that they appealed it. They got like another like six months tagged on. He ended up doing like 18 months, but it was a very, very short stint uh, and a really just a slap on the wrist for someone that was convicted of being one of the biggest mob bosses in America. Uh, at the end of Jack Tocco's life, he actually came under further scrutiny because Tony Zerilli, who was his underboss, his first cousin, his best friend, who was still very, um, still very sore over the demotion, uh, when he came out of prison from his sentence from the same case, he ended up having to do about seven years. Um, he came out of prison and Jack Togo was so mad at him for erasing this veneer that he had had of a legitimate businessman that he pulled his stripes and put him on the shelf, meaning that he couldn't do anything. And he was broke and, and was he, Tony's really at the end of his life. I spent a bunch of time with him at the end of his life uh, was a, was a broken man, uh, physically, emotionally, financially, uh, in every way, shape, or form. He blamed it on Jack Toko, and he eventually went to the FBI in 2014 and told them, or 2013 rather, and told them that Jack Togo had buried Jimmy Hoffa on his farm up in Rochester at uh, Oakland, uh, or at Adams and Buell Road. Uh, they went up and searched that farm. They did not find anything. 
Um, and Jack Toko and Tony Zerilli died not speaking to each other. Uh, their wives were not speaking to each other. It was a very, very bitter, bitter uh, family split. Um, and that brings us to today. And I will just finish off by telling you that the crime family is still uh, is still uh, operational, still functioning. It is now in the hands of this man, uh, Jackie the Kid Jackaloni, who is the son of Billy Jackaloni and the nephew of Tony Jackaloni. And his name has actually been in the paper uh, recently, in the last couple weeks, months, um, regarding a tax case that he's dealing with right now and uh, the whole Phil Mickelson um, uh, hubbub that happened back when he came in town to play golf and it came out that he had had a gambling debt and this is the guy he had the gambling debt to. And uh, according to court records, Phil Mickelson was owed about a half a million dollars uh, in gambling debts from Jackie Jacqueline and Jackie Jacqueline told him that he wasn't going to pay him. And if you're Phil Mickelson, what are you going to do? You're not going to sue him. You're not going to threaten him. So you're just going to kind of put your tail between your legs and, and go away. That was about 15 years ago. Um, but because that Phil Mickelson was coming into town for, for golf and because Jackie's name was in the paper this year because of his tax issues, it popped up on the front page of the paper. Uh, I think it was in June. So uh, it's, it's, it's alleged he's not, he has not been convicted of being the Detroit uh, mob Don, but I'm comfortable in saying that he is. Um, and uh, this is a picture from a bus he took in, in 1991, I believe. So he looks a little different. Um, but uh, Jack Jackaloni is the future of the Detroit Mafia. And Jack Toko's nephews are kind of his uh, right-hand men. And, and, and the Detroit mob lives on today. So that's my talk. I'm sorry if I was a little bit all over the place. I haven't done this talk in about a year, a year and a half. So I was just kind of getting some of the rust off. But uh, I will open it up to anybody that has questions or, yeah. In your opinion, are they a network Yes, okay. <laughs> so uh, I believe that Jimmy Hoffa was picked up uh, in Tony. Uh, so the, the one piece of physical evidence that's been collected by the FBI in the Jimmy Hoffa investigation is the car that he was kidnapped in and probably transported uh, when, he, when he was murdered, his body was probably transported to wherever he was uh, eventually laid to rest. And it was Tony Giacalone's son, Joey Giacalone, it was his car. Um, the FBI right now believes that in that car was Billy Giacalone, Tony Palazzolo, who's a name I haven't brought up yet here, uh, and Sally Bergoglio. Uh, Sally Bergoglio or Sally Bugs Bergoglio was a uh, member of the Genovese crime family in New York. And part of the way that they were getting Jimmy Hoffa to unknowingly go to his slaughter was that they were um, 10 minutes of questions or? Oh, 10 minutes. I'll be done in 10 minutes taking questions and then I'll stay. These are all questions. I'm done with my talk. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, right. So Tony Palazzolo, Sally Bergoglio, and Billy Jack Deloney picked him up in the car. Uh, I believe they took him uh, to Long Lake and Telegraph to a house that was owned by Carlo Licata. Uh, Carlo Licata was a brother-in-law to Jack Tocco, uh, was a made member of the mafia. He was actually a mafia prince himself. His dad was the mafia boss of L.A., he uh, married into the Detroit family, and Carlo Licata's house was often used as a place for meetings between the Jackalones and Hoffa. Um, so Hoffa would be comfortable going to that house. Hoffa was supposed to meet Tony Jackalone at the Red Fox uh, at 15 and Telegraph. He was also supposed to meet a guy by the name of Tony Provenzano, who was a, a New York mobster that he was in a beef with. Sally Bugs was that New York mobster's right hand. So if Jimmy Hoffa came to uh, Joey Jacqueline's car and he saw Tony Powell and Billy Jack and then he saw Tony Pro's guy there and he knew he was going to go meet Tony Pro and Tony Jack, it would make sense to him that Billy was coming to get him for Tony and Sally was coming to get him for Tony Pro. So I think he would have felt comfortable getting into that car. 
I believe he got into that car. They took him about a mile and a half north to Carlo Licata's house, killed him at Licata's house, and then took him to Central Sanitation in Hamtramck and incinerated him. Uh, two things to know about that theory. First, Central Sanitation burned down in an arson fire about eight months later before the FBI could get in there with a search warrant. Um, Central Sanitation was owned by the Corrados, the Vitalis, and a guy by the name of Jimmy Quasarano, who was another major mob figure around here. Um, Motor City Barber Supply, if anyone remembers that, uh, and the Motor City Boxing Gym. Um, and Carlo Licata, who was Jack Toko's brother-in-law, whose house many people believe Hoffa was murdered at, Carl Licata ended up dead at that house under very, very suspicious circumstances, almost five years to the minute. Uh, Hoffa disappeared and was killed on July 30th, 1975. Carl Licata died in that same house. Uh, or I should say Jimmy Hoffa was murdered most likely at three o'clock in the afternoon on July 30th, 1975 at that house. Carl Licata either was killed or committed suicide at that house on July 30th, 1980 at three o'clock. Uh, he, he was shot twice in the chest and the gun was found about 15 feet away from him with no fingerprints. So you, you kind of do the math. So that was a long, long answer to that question. Both. <laughs> Just look what's going on in Macomb County right now. There's been a huge Macomb County corruption probe that's been active now for about five years. Now, no members of organized crime have actually been indicted in it, but a lot of the people that have been indicted in it, if you do some digging, you can find connections with these guys. One specific instance that I can talk about, and I don't I don't feel like it's libel or slander because it's the truth. Uh, Judge Rich. Richard Coretti in uh, Macomb County Circuit Court. Um, the last major Detroit mob arrest took place uh, about nine years ago. Uh, the two Deanna brothers, Joe Dana and, and Mimo Dana, uh, owned a series of Italian restaurants called Tiramisu. Um, and the original Tiramisu was on 23 and uh, on 23 and Shaner. And across the street from it, another Italian restaurant opened in around 2010, 11, called Nona, called Nona's Kitchen. And Nona's Kitchen um, was being extorted by the Dana brothers. And the Dana brothers kept on going to the owner of Nona's Kitchen and telling him that they had to shut down or pay them street tax because they couldn't have an Italian restaurant on the same street that their Italian restaurant was on. The owner of Nona's Kitchen continually rebuffed these extortion attempts. And then in 2011, Joe Dana and Mimo Dana went in there with a baseball bat and hit him 12 times over the head with a baseball bat, put him in the hospital for two months. Uh, he was near death. Uh, he was charged in Macomb County with attempted murder. Uh, Judge Coretti gave them house arrest in six months uh, and the FBI was so upset by this that they indicted the Dana brothers a second time uh, under federal uh, racketeering laws. And the Danas were saying, well, this is double jeopardy. We were already, but no, that was the state court. This was the federal court. So there was the belief uh, of the FBI that Judge Coretti uh, had done something wrong. I'm not going to say he did. I know, I know Rick Coretti. My dad knows Rick Coretti, um, but I will say that the FBI is of the opinion that Rick, Rick Coretti had, had been gotten to and had given the Dana brothers a light sentence uh, because of that. And then uh, when I was talking about Jack Tocco's light sentence, that was uh, Judge Corbett O'Meara. Yeah, so the Hillcrest Golf Club uh, was owned by Jack Tocco. It was another kind of ground zero for the Detroit mob at, in its heyday. Um, the Hillcrest Golf Club was, 
I'm not exactly sure where it was. It was somewhere in Macomb County off Gratiot, I think. Cass and Grossbeck. Uh, my grandfather was actually club champion there uh, back in 1967, 68, 69. My dad and my grandpa spent quite a bit of time at Hillcrest. Yes, Jack Toko owned it um, along with a guy by the name of Jimmy Tamer, James Tamer, they called Jimmy Eyes, uh, who was uh, a Lebanese and Syrian. His brother-in-law has a park named after him called George George Park, if any of you are aware of that uh, piece of property. And I would say that Detroit might be the only, or Metro Detroit might be the only city that names parks after convicted racketeers. Yes, Sam Calinati. Yeah, I mean, back then there was a lot more elbow rubbing amongst you know, criminals and politicians and judges. Now it's done in a much more secretive manner uh, behind closed doors. Back then, I would say, I, I would say up into the 60s, it was done kind of out in the open. So, uh, yeah, but it wasn't just, it was like a who's, you know, uh, these, these parties that singing Sam Calinati would have, it'd be like a who's who of high society Detroit. So yes, there were judges, and lawyers there, but there were also, you know, the, the most prominent tailor, the most prominent restaurateur, you know, it was like all of like the biggest names in, in, in Detroit society would come to these parties. And I don't even know, honestly, if some of the people that were going there really even knew who Sam Calinati was, other than that he was a rich guy that had a big party and liked to sing opera. Yeah, so, yeah, so, Detroit, another, another example of how Detroit uh, was an anomaly, that in almost every other city, um, there was a, a very uh, violent takeover of the black numbers racket uh, in New York and Chicago and Philadelphia and Boston. Um, the African-American racketeers did not want to give up their business to the Italians. The Italians just went in and took it. Uh, in Detroit, because one of the hallmarks of the, the Detroit mob has always been diplomacy, um, the, the African-American racketeers and the Italian racketeers always worked in concert. So the numbers business, starting back in the late 20s, uh, Johnny Roxborough, who was the kind of the first numbers kingpin in Detroit, um, if anyone is a boxing fan here, they might recognize the name because Johnny Roxborough was Joe Lewis's manager, um, but he was also uh, a very prominent numbers guy. Uh, the Gotham Hotel, which was the, 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 one of the centerpieces of, of Paradise Valley and Black Bottom, um, was another place that was a, a headquarters of, of, numbers, uh, of numbers operations that were being run in, com uh, in connection between the Italians and the African-Americans. Uh, in the 40s and 50s, it was a guy by the name of Everett Monk Watson. And Monk Watson, kind of another uh, uh, story that was similar to singing Sam Calinati. Monk Watson had a piece of property on the west side of the state by Idlewald, which was a, a very popular uh, resort destination for African-Americans around the country. They'd all come to the Benton, Benton Harbor, Battle Creek area to this Idlewald. And uh, right by Idlewald, Monk Watson had an estate. And he would, just like there would be all the most prominent white members of society going to Singing Sam's uh, place in, in the 1920s in Detroit, you had all the most prominent African-American Detroiters in the 30s and 40s and 50s that would head west and all they'd have these extravagant weekend getaways at Monk Watson's uh, estate. Monk Watson eventually uh, gave way to Eddie Wingate, um, who was a, a, a big numbers guy that worked with the Italians. Eddie Wingate was actually the owner of the 20 Grand, which was a, a, a famous club in Detroit that was known as uh, the place that Barry Gordy would break all of the uh, Motown stars. Before they would go on, the, uh, on a national tour, he would start them at the 20 grand. And Eddie Wingate, they called him uh, Fast Eddie or Bigfoot Eddie, was probably the biggest uh, African-American racketeer 
of that time period. And uh, he was actually a Barry Gordy contemporary. Um, in the same time that Motown was started, Eddie Wingate started Golden World Records. And in between 1958 and 1961, Golden World and Motown were kind of neck and neck. Um, nobody knows what Golden World Records is now. Barry Gordy in 1961 absorbed Golden World and just took Golden World. And a lot of the, I shouldn't say a lot, a handful of the, the signature Motown acts came from Golden World and Eddie, and Eddie Wingate. So Eddie Wingate was very tied into that whole Motown, Motown scene. So that that's kind of answers your question. But in terms of the Italians, the Corrado crew, uh, Machine Gun Pete Corrado, and then his sons, Tony the Bull Corrado and Detroit Fats Corrado were the guys that were in charge of all the numbers. And they were based out of Greektown. So I think this is it for me in front of you guys, but I will stay around for as long as you guys want to come and you can ask me questions. And I'm, I'd love to come back and do a Purple Gang talk, or I know we were talking before the pandemic about me doing a, a Rat Pack, uh, the mob and the Rat Pack. Uh, I'd love to do that talk too. I will end you with this tiny little anecdote that I think is fascinating that Sammy Davis Jr. and Frank Sinatra met in Detroit. And I mean, at the book Cadillac. They didn't know each other until they had a meeting at the book Cadillac uh, in Detroit. And everybody knows about uh, Sammy Davis and Frank Sinatra, but it all started on Washington Avenue in downtown Detroit at the book Cadillac Hotel. <laughs>